Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode and it's part of our Women in Engineering series. We have Miranda Shope, who is the Vice President of Operations at Avid Solutions. Welcome, Miranda. Thank you. It's great to be on the call with you today. Oh, absolutely. Looking so forward to, to walking with you through this story and, and sharing your story with others, inspiring some women out there. Very excited to have you as a guest. And we'd love to start these episodes. We're just talking about the journey, you know, to the role that you're in now. So that would help us if you could just walk us through that. Interestingly, I think someone told me one day that my resume looked more like a zigzag than a line, which was intriguing to them. So um, I think that kind of zigzag started very early. I wanted to be an engineer. I knew that. I grew up in a paper mill town. Smelled horrible. That was definitely not an option, but they gave away a lot of scholarships. My mom and dad kind of said, it's free money, so why don't you go? Interestingly, the vice president of technology at the time, he's since passed away. His name was Barry Mitchell, was a wonderful man. He um, presented me with my scholarship to NC State to major in pulp and paper, and I told him I was going to take his money and never work in a paper mill. And I ate those words for the last 20 years. And uh, he reminded me of that many times before he passed away. So after going to paper school, I went to work for Honeywell MeasureX, selling process control systems, delivering them um, in the paper industry for many, many years all over the U.S. Through that, I kind of realized that I really liked the aspects of kind of commercial and technical, but I didn't want to be a salesperson and I didn't want to be a projects person. And I really looked out to um, getting into kind of the estimating side of life and really doing contracts and having a balance between designing systems and being in the commercial play at the same time. And I think that really shaped, you know, all the decisions I made after that. I ended up getting my MBA while working at Honeywell just really thought I knew that I wanted to do something kind of hybrid, but definitely in business management and kind of take my engineering degree and build on it in different ways. I then received a deal of a lifetime and went to work with a longtime customer at a paper mill, spent some years in the mill in production, learned a lot there too. Definitely very different than being a technical consultant in a vendor role, but one of the best decisions I ever made because I got to be a customer. I got to live with all the things I'd sold. I got to understand how those decisions are made, you know, capital procurement, all the processes in life that if you don't understand, you don't know how to sell in in the way that people think. So that step parlayed me um, to Rockwell. And through Rockwell, I had multiple roles, starting in an estimating role and ending in managing global operations for their systems and solutions business, which included engineering centers in India and China, multiple manufacturing centers that we were responsible for, the PMO and the delivery for estimating globally. I traveled the world for years, and that was also awesome. And, you know, definitely shaped again another part of my life, not only personally, just from the cultural experiences and dynamics that I didn't know I'd ever have, but, you know, also just the what did I want to do next, which is how I ended up at Avid. You know, I spent 20 years in large companies and wanted the experience of what it was like to work in a small company, having a lot more autonomy, um, being able to influence people differently without the boundaries of large company structure and that's what brought me here. Wow. Okay. So I'm getting the zigzag reference now. <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing story, Miranda. That is awesome. So you, you you did the support work at Honeywell 
then you really got that end user experience when you went to work in the paper mill itself, right? I'm making sure I'm, I'm following you correctly. Yep. Okay. Yep. I started in projects and moved into sales, then moved into manufacturing all over the place. Okay. And we kind of, we glazed over it, but you had uh, this Barry Mitchell, who's very influential in your, in your early career and helping with your college. So you, where did you go to school at? I went to NC State. All right. Go Pack. Got a lot of Pack fans, I'm sure, listening to, uh, to, to our podcast. So that is, that is wonderful. And then you're Stanton Rockwell. So you were spending a lot of time uh, in the air, it sounds like, going all over. Yes. Yeah. I did. I would leave and spend three or four weeks in India. Then I'd go to China for a week or two, then Europe for a week or two, and Latin America, back to the U.S., and do it all over again. But most of my time was probably spent between India and China. Probably 60% of my time was in Asia. Okay. Well, where where did you enjoy going the most? I love India. I would have moved to India. It is the it was never on my bucket list. You know, I think maybe not on many people's bucket list, but it was one of the most beautiful cultures I've ever experienced. I learned so much from my team personally. It changed kind of my experience and my view of that country and what it's like to live there, as well as you know, it's such an up and coming, growing area. And one of the neatest things was every time I was there and we were working on a new project, a new technology or rolling out some new changes, it was openly embraced and eagerly moved forward. And I think that's something that sometimes, you know, we all struggle to get in when we're in roles that are agents of change, kind of roles like an operations role and stuff, your job is to drive change and not accept the status quo. And that's harder to do in, you know, older, more legacy cultures where things have been done the same way for a long time, or you have lots of old industry that's been around for forever, like a paper industry. It's been around for many, many, many years. So it's very traditional that things continue to run the way they run because it works, right? And what was great about India is the energy behind doing something new because you could. No doubt. No doubt. That, that's that's wonderful. Now, with Avid now, you're, you're the VP of operations. So, you know, what does that a day look like for you there? Well, the whole delivery team um, reports through my group. So I have engineering managers, PMO, project managers, all of the engineers delivering projects. And a lot of my team also is responsible for client management. Um, so we we split sales between what we call net new versus existing customers. So basically the existing customers, um, client managers or salespeople report through my team too. So a, a given day can range Anything from, you know, internal dynamics on a project, talking to a customer about a current project or reviewing proposals to sell a project, or it can just be meeting with customers to figure out what's their budget for the year and what's next. Also mentoring my team, coaching my team, putting strategies together for our training or the things that we need to do next, right? What's helping grow our younger engineers and how we want to influence them in their next steps or their development desires. So it's a little bit of everything. So Absolutely. It sounds like it's a lot of fun. And it's always changing and you're definitely in an exciting role. And, you know, part of this women in engineering series, we're, we're trying to inspire. And, and that's why we reached out to you and, and, and cause we know that, that you're going to bring that inspiration. And, and for that, the women that are listening right now, what's some advice that you like to share with them about this industry? I think things have changed a lot probably since I started. It, it's definitely a high achiever, high performance industry, um, at least from the heavy industries aspect that I came from, you know, paper mills, et cetera. You know, I, I described, you know, kind of my early life in the paper industry, whether it was working for MeasureX delivering systems or even when I went to the mill is when something runs at 3,600 feet a minute, you're making good and bad decisions that fast and you need to be making good ones. So the intensity of that environment really 
you know, showcases winners that win, I think. So if you like kind of the chaos and the madness behind always having something to work on, um, I think that, you know, people who have those natural tendencies tend to just love that. And I, I think that was what appealed to me was there was never a dull moment. My mill manager at the paper mill would tell us every day, pick a fight with the process. And so it always meant that you had something new to work on. So it's a great place to be an engineer because you were never bored. But I definitely think from being a woman and being one of few in a lot of my positions, if not the only one in many of them, it, you know, it's, it's different. And so I think trying to find a way to be yourself and continue to be yourself, right? You can always be too much or too little of something for somebody, but you can never apologize for being who you are. And I think that that's an awesome place to work from and something that I always worked from was just who I was, right? That's right. That's, that is awesome. You're right. You, you, you can't forget that, right? Because it's so easy. We want to con- sometimes conform to the situation and just be yourself, you know, and, and you're, you're there for a reason. They hired you for a reason and loved your answer. I mean, that intensity, you're talking about winners that win. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm feeling it. I mean, that is awesome. You know, a lot of times when we hear in this industry, there's myths out there, right? And, and I yep. know I want, I want to ask you this question. So, what is a common myth about women that are in industry that you'd love to debunk? Hmm. You can have it all. I, I think that that's the hardest part. I watched a lot of my peers that I graduated with or that I met through the years forego their careers for family or other scenarios because it's a lot. You know, when you work in a paper mill, we used to laugh and say that you're married to the mill and your spouse is your actual mistress because, you know, they're the one who sees you on the side. The mill always saw you first. When my husband and I were working together at the mill, you can imagine, you know, we had three kids and sometimes 16 hour days. And there were sometimes we went into the mill and didn't come home for two or three days. And, um, but, you know, those were just days in the end, you know, we both had careers that we loved and, that for me was important. So I got to share it in multiple ways. I got to share it with having a great family. My career continued to grow and move. You know, I made it through a paper mill in the South in the middle of the 2000s and learned probably more there from the operators and the people I worked for on a day-to-day basis than I learned as a whole. So, you know, it's how you choose to embrace the things that are put in front of you and doing something with each and everything you learn every day. And I think that every woman in the world can have it all. Right. So. I, lo- I love that answer. You can have it all. You know, it, it, you're right. And, and, you know, I have two daughters and I cannot wait for them to hear this series and to listen to people like you share this type of, of insight and knowledge and inspiration. So uh, that's a great one. And Miranda went, when you're in that moment where, where things are, are clicking, and, and I call it a moment of flow, right? You're, you're doing what you love. You're, you're, you're making an impact. What are you doing right then? The moments that I felt like I was doing what I was meant to do is when I was resolving issues of making sure my team remained progressive and successful and growing, but also it was the moments that I stood up for them when they were right and someone else didn't acknowledge that or didn't give them credit for the things that they had done. And I think that that's the moment that I feel like I'm where I need to be is when I feel both of those. That is awesome. Great answer. You know, we also love on this podcast, Miranda, to give a chance to give the shout outs to the people who have helped us and influenced us in our careers. Are there any mentors that stand out? You've already mentioned that, you know, Barry Mitchell was was very influential in your college days, but just just other mentors that you like to recognize. Um, yeah. So um, Gus Katros, I met when I was in college. He was at the time VP of uh, Roman Haas, which is no longer, you know, a company that's been acquired multiple times since. But I met Gus and Gus became as much of a kind of a father figure in my life as he became the person that I called. I remember when I 
uh, decided to leave Honeywell and I didn't even know how to quit a job, you know, and he was the guy I called and talked it all through. Um, he is still the person I talked to today. He's been retired for many, many years and we don't miss a month without talking on the phone. Um, so that's 20 something years of, I don't know what I would have done without him. There are days that he was the person who helped me know what to do next because I couldn't have done it on my own. And then I think, you know, I just, I have just been honestly blessed with some of the best bosses every at the paper mill. You know, I worked for the mill manager, Alan Sanders. He is an amazing, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Super talented at Rockwell, Tom Green, Hedwig Moss. I mean, just some of the best bosses that without them continuing to believe in me and pushing me, I wouldn't be where I am today because it was people like them who gave me opportunities that I maybe didn't even see for myself. So again, I've been so fortunate to have been blessed in so many different ways. Uh, Jane Barr at Rockwell, she's regional vice president of sales, was one of the best mentors I had during my seven years at Rockwell. And again, we still, we still talk to this day. So so many people who just touched my life in many ways. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing so many of those with our listeners. And we're also with this Women in Engineering series, we're trying to, to give people resources, particularly if they're trying to come to this industry. What have been some of the places that you've tapped in the past that have helped you along the way? Oh, you know, I, I think throughout it's a, a ton of different things. I think people, obviously, that are the first place I go. I continue to always connect with different people who have different perspectives than I do. I, th- I read a lot. I read a lot of technology. I watch a lot of, um, you know, technology videos, etc. I read a lot of books about people. You know, I think if you embrace learning about yourself early in your career and you realize where your strengths are and maybe where you're not so, you know, more, I don't call them weaknesses, but more opportunities for improvement. For me, it's the soft skills, right? Like I, I know that I make decisions very business-like they're, they're very much what's the right thing to do for the customer or what's the right financial thing. And so thinking about the way people might perceive change is something that's not as natural for me. So I spend a lot of time talking to people who have that aspect or maybe have a background in HR and saying, what do you think people will perceive or how could we manage this change? So, you know, I think really tapping into all those pieces are important. Now you mentioned you're you're doing a lot of reading, you know, any books or resources that you that have really helped you develop that that you like to share? Um, I mean, I read a lot of different things. There's a great book that I really love that is definitely a great read and very much about negotiations with people. It's called Hostage at the Table. Um, it's written by a former, I think he was a FBI or CIA negotiator who um, writes from the perspective of how to stay on top in negotiations, right? And he talks about, you know, that from a hostage scenario, but it's very much translated into business acumen. I thought that was really, again, you know, soft skills type scenario. It's how do you take the time to understand people and what they want and why they behave the way that they do? And it's really extracting those inputs out of it. I thought that was great. I've read a, another book recently called Growth Mindset. Really interesting. Um, I'm gonna have to I read check a little bit that. of everything. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to check out that hostage at the table. That sounds like a fun read. It is. It reads really like you're reading just a fun book, right? Not like a business book. So. Right, right. Go. Very good. So, got any highlights of your career? That you, you you obviously have a stellar career. Anything that stands out that you look to, like to look back and hang your hat on? And say, you know what? I was a part of that. I I think I was the bigger thing that I think I influenced a lot of people. I inherited teams at times that when I inherited them, people told me, "I think you're going to have to let half this team go, or this isn't going to work." 
And to this day, those people are still in their careers and successful. And I think that's the thing I would hang my hat on the most for someone who knows that soft skills aren't necessarily my first forte, but leadership and growing people turned out to be something I didn't realize I could do and definitely the thing that I'm the most proud of. Very good. And now everybody learns differently too, Miranda. So, you know, how do you, you know, what's your, what's your learning style? How do you continue to learn to stay on top of things? Cause you're in a, in a, a changing role that things are moving so fast. Just curious on the, the different avenues that you take to uh, stay on top. I think, like I said, you know, one thing I would say to anybody as a whole was, you know, never burn a bridge because every person that I have ever worked with, I am somehow still connected to. And we've all gone on to likely be in different places now, different careers, different companies, et cetera. So the network of people that I have to reach out to as resources, even if it's just, you know, as a friend, hey, what do you know about this? Or tell me about this industry because I've not spent time there. People who are inside of companies that instead of having to go through traditional channels to get information, I have inside call the phone number and say, all right, I'm looking for information on this product. How do I get that the quickest? You know? So I think for me, the way I learn is again, through my network and building that network out through the years was one of the things I learned early was you always have to have a network which is why you never burn bridges and why you keep all those people as a part of your Rolodex through the years. So I try to learn through people. So. That's a great way. Great advice. I mean, the network is so important and we so often it's overlooked and, you know, the way you leave a job is sometimes this is important is the way you come into it. Right. So. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going. It's what people say about you when you're gone that matters, right? That's, that's kind right. of one of those sayings. Yep. That's right. So. You're all over it. You know, what what are they saying when you're not around? <laughs> you know. That's right. So, so how about uh, things you like to do at work? Is there anything that you wish you had more time to do? Uh, I think the hardest thing for me has been through my career is creating work life balance. I work a lot because I love it. And so it's the cutting it off at night. That's probably the things that I wish I had done more of or had more time to do because I am so devoted to making sure things are as successful as I expect them to be. So I I think that's the biggest thing. And I strive in the chaos. I like it when I have more things to do than I can get done in a day. So I don't always leave myself time for things to be different than that. <laughs> so. Right. Right. Well, that's good. I mean, it's, you're definitely got so much going on. I mean, work-life balance is important and there's so many aspects of that, right? You know, you have your, your career, your, your financial goals, your spiritual goal, all the physical, all these things. It's hard to keep them all in balance when you have so much going on. So it's, uh, it's good that you recognize that that's important. And Absolutely. we we love to have these episodes where, you know, we, we take a, 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 side, a side road and we get off the career and the work and, and the things that, that are driving us forward. And we, we just learn about our, our guests and we'd love to learn a little bit about you, maybe some hobbies, anything you'd like to share with our listeners? I don't really have a lot of hobbies except for spending time with my kids. I would say my kids are all high level athletes. So my son who is now older, he's a golf pro at a country club, but he played college golf and AJGA golf. And so when he was younger, it was taking him to golf lessons and golf tournaments. And then my girls came along and my middle daughter is a multi-time world and natural national champion equestrian. So she travels the world and has been traveling since she was seven years old by herself to horse shows at times and is super, super talented. And then my youngest daughter is a high level, world's level all-star cheerleader. So we compete all year long with her and we travel everywhere from, you know, Orlando to Kentucky to up North and we're always on the go. So my spare time that's not working is on airplanes and in cars, driving my kids places and watching them do what they love. Right. 
Uh, and we breed, I guess my, my closest hobby, my middle daughter and I, we are breeding horses. So I now have two babies on the ground and one more on the way. So that's kind of been a lot of fun to kind of pick the studs and see what's going to be made at the end and then, you know, watch them in a few years to see if they turn out to be something special. So. Yeah, that is awesome. So when, when the, the equestrian parts are, are you traveling? How far out do you guys go with that? I mean, just curious. Kansas City. Okay. Um, we go to Kansas City every November for the national championship. They're, you know, they go to Tampa all over. Um, I'm actually leaving this week to go to Shelbyville, Tennessee. So we go everywhere. So. so is that pretty much like a monthly thing where it's, there's always a show going that she's getting ready for? Yeah, she she goes probably two to three times a month. She does a lot of catch riding for other trainers and other people. So she goes a lot. But she um, she's in a, a special high school for athletes who do stuff like this. So she travels all the time. So she does a lot of her school online. And so she's capable of traveling everywhere when she needs to. So sometimes she just hops on a plane and Somebody picks her up on the other end and she shows for a couple of days and comes home. And sometimes she goes to Kentucky and stays for three, four, five weeks. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's not just her horses. She's doing this with other people's horses too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. She's got, uh, she, the world and national championship she won was on a catch ride for another owner. Very cool. Very cool. So you had the two daughters and the son. Any anything else on your family you'd like to share? My husband and I, we've been married almost 20 years now. Um, we uh, have always worked together. We met as at Measure X. We left Measure X to go to the paper mill together. We left the paper mill, went to Rockwell together. Now we're at Avid together. We've had very parallel careers. He's more of a sales technology guy, and I'm definitely more operations and project driven and so we're kind of each other's yin and yang from not only a personality standpoint but a work standpoint so it's always worked really well for us to work together and that has been a privilege we've had for a long time so well it sounds like you guys have a a great relationship and just a, a wonderful family a lot of fun things happening you know any any surprises lately that that's caught you off guard uh, no, I mean, I think just the world as a whole right now is surprising. Every day seems to be something new. And so I think just adapting to that. Um, but, you know, to me, kind of like I said before, I kind of like the change and the chaos. And so the part of just every with everything changing every day, it's something new to process. You know, it gives us a a new issue to think about, okay, how do we sell in this new norm? How do we respond to our customers? You know, what precautions do we need? You know, all the different things that every company is dealing with right now, but definitely those pieces I think are probably the most surprising lately. It's like you tell your kids this when they ask you, what is this, right? You say, I don't know. I've never experienced this in my lifetime, <laughs> you know? So it's dealing with, daily dynamics and um, that I think every day there's kind of a new one because we're moving forward in a different norm that we're constantly adapting to. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, just, just with with me and my daughters that we're in summer camp now and we just found out that, you know, we're, we're, they're having to wear these special types of masks at summer camp and, you know, they're, they're eight and nine and kind of caught them off guard, but Hey, this is, this is the new normal, guys. So it's, you know, sorry, still have fun at camp, but, you know, it's definitely a, a changing world, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, every day there's a different dynamic. So I wake up every day and you've got a new scenario to approach. And so for sure, I'm not sure that that will stop for a little while either. Very good. Now, you, you've traveled the world, you've seen so many things. If you could pick one, destination for a, a family vacation that you have that you haven't done yet where would it be Bora 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 okay yep I my kids would all tell you my dream vacation is a tiki hut in Bora Bora with no internet no cell phones so. just be disconnected right disconnected a beautiful ocean a lounge chair and a book and life would be good 
So I hear you. I hear you. Well, this has been so much fun working with you, Miranda. Uh, I know you've inspired so many women out there. I've loved your story, all the the, the turns and twists that that you that you had here. But we call it Eco S Y, and we love to 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 wrap up with the why trying to to bring that inspiration so why do you enjoy the path you're on and 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 what drives you oh you know i think when i was young i i told so many people this i have always wanted to run my own company it was just something i always felt and i think every decision that i've ever made has been something i've benefited from but I think, like I told you, I think more than anything, it started with a technical kind of mindset. And now it's become such a people mindset. I love what I do because of the people that I'm around every day. The people that mentor me, the people that I get to work with, the customers, the people that I get to grow and see promoted or move into new aspects of their own career. I enjoy every piece of learning and growing personally and with others. So. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, you, you, you've done a, a phenomenal job in your career and you're definitely helping others too. And Miranda, I just cannot thank you enough for taking the time on this Women in Engineering series to, to walk through with us for our listeners. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.